vow of a Nazarite setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way and this requirement applies as long as they are set apart to the Lord
priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who call you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah, and he said, Go down to the porter's shop, and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me, and I found the porter walking at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay and again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh Israel, can I not do to you as this porter has done to this clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priest and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hung himself. And the leading priest picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they say, since it was payment for murder. And after some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field. And they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That is why the field is still called the field of blood. These fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah that says, They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord detected, directed. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Father, we thank you. We are standing before your presence. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are alive. We thank you, Jesus, that you have got plan for every one of us. How I pray in the name of Jesus, that this afternoon as we stand before you, that Lord, you speak to us, and you speak to our spirit, and you position us, and we will rise up to become what you want us to be. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 1, 17, yes. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Uh, this morning, I would like to share with us the calling of the Lord and the season we are at. We are at the season uh, where we celebrate Easter. Easter marks the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we will never understand Easter well until we know the reason why he came. And I want to bring to you the big picture why Jesus came. Many a times, we have failed to paint the big picture. We always see the small picture. Number one, Jesus did not come to heal you physically. That was not the agenda. It may have been a secondary agenda, but the primary agenda was not to heal you. Jesus did not come to, be, to give you a bigger house than the one you live today. That was not the agenda. He also did not come to make you dress better than you used to dress before. That was not the agenda. It may have been a secondary agenda. But the primary agenda of Jesus was to come and give us eternal life. Was to come and help us live with him. Was to come and make us be like him was to come and mold us and shape us and make us a people 
who are like him. And that's why when he met these, uh, these, this, uh, his disciples, Bible says in verse 17 of the book of Mark, Come and follow me. The calling was to come and follow him. And in the following, he will make them to be like him. We are also called to follow Jesus. And as we follow him, he will mold us, he will shape us, he will make us what he desires us to be, a people who can qualify to be called his children. A people who can qualify to see things the way he sees them. A people who can qualify to do things the way he does his things. A people who are like Jesus. It was the agenda of our God. The agenda was not to come and give us stuff. The agenda was not to come and make us look good from the outside. The agenda was to deal with the inner man because the goal was that we may have eternal life through Jesus. Yes. That was the ultimate goal of our Savior. And that is the reason why he came and left glory. Not to come and add you another car or another something. All those things are good. And I'm not saying they are bad. And I'm not saying they are not going to happen. No. But the greatest agenda, the greatest goal, and the big picture of Easter, it is a Savior who came. That he may mold us and shape us. And he may build us and make us be like him. Sometimes we have gotten it wrong and we have gotten the notion wrong because we always measure the presence of Jesus and we always measure the blessing of Jesus with how the car I drive, the dress I wear, the clothes I have, the family I have. It's not true. You cannot measure the presence of Jesus by the car I drive. Neither can you measure whether I am blessed by God by the home I live. Not true. The measurement of a man of God or a woman of God is the work that the Lord has done in the inner man of the, of, of the, of the man or woman of God. And the heart of man of God, it is the measurement that you can tell. The character that he has molded and the way he has shaped you. Because he called them and Bible says, and I will make you fishers of men. That was the goal. Number one is to come. You have to live your old life and come. You have to leave the old person you used to be. You have to leave your old view of seeing things and come. You have to step out of the old way of doing things. You have to step out of the old way. You used to see things. You have to step out of the way you used to analyze things. You have to step out of your old attitude. And come. And follow. In other words, for you to be like Jesus, for you to become what he wants you to be, you have to follow. And this word follow is bigger than just walking behind somebody. Following is when you obey the words of the Lord and you put them in your mind and you practice them in your life. That is the following Jesus was talking about. And after you obey and you come and you follow, then he will make you. In other words, it is him now who will work inside of you to make you. You. So you are God's project. You are God's project. God is working in you. But for you to allow him to work in you, you have first to come. You have to step out and say, Lord, I surrender. I come. I now belong to you because I have come. Good example when I met Joanne, my wife, first we started being good friends. And there was no commitment. And uh, the relationship was a casual relationship. If I tell her, we meet at a certain place and it is important, 
and she tells me I'm busy, I can't come because it was just a casual relationship, I would take it. But the moment she came and she said, I have come, and she stood before men and women, and she said, now I belong to Mr. Washira. And after that, she made vows, and we tied the knot. And after that, we exchanged links. I gave her my ring, and she gave me hers. And we declared together we belong to each other. Now, we started a relationship. And a serious covenantal relationship. A, a relationship that cannot be broken. A relationship now with a direction. Because she came, and I came to her. And now, we, we, uh, I, uh, she belonged to me, and I belonged to her. And now she had one had, she have got 100% claim of me. I have got 100% claim of her. Even she, when she walks in the street, you don't know that is Mrs. Washira. And when you see Mr. Washira on the road, you will be told you don't know that is Joanne's husband. They are legal crowds. We belong to each other. Because she came to me. She belonged to me. The moment you come to Christ, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to Christ. You are owned by Christ. You are Jesus person. You are Jesus property as the man of God says. You are his property. And because you are his property, now there is covenantal relationship. You must be willing to be molded and to be shaped. For every relationship, another step we took to a church. And we are joined together. And we became one. And Joanne came to me because I had a vision. I had to give her the bigger vision of my life. I didn't tell her I'll marry you because I'll buy you a better car than you used to drive. I didn't ever tell her I'll marry you because I'll build you a house. That, is, that was not a vision good enough for her. She needed to hear where are we going? How many children are we going to have? What is the vision you'd have for my children? Where are we after this? Where do we go? Jesus, when we come to him, same way he explains to us. If you pay attention, he explains to us. And life becomes a journey. And for us to be like him, there are things that we had to forsake. When John came to me, there are a few things that we agreed. This and that you have to, to stop. And you have to start building now on this. There are things that you want you had to forsake. Also because I also came to her. There were things that I had that I had to forsake. No, I, and uh, it is explained very clearly. If you had other, other people near you like other girls around you, Mr. Washira. Now you have to leave all the others. Because now, and close those old accounts because you belong to me. And now you have to walk like a married man. You have to think like a married man. You have to dress like a married man. You have to live like a married man. You have to treat my children the way a father treated the children. You are no longer a single young man. You are mine. And if I find you with any other woman, I have got any, every right to ask you, who is that and what are you doing with her? Because you belong to me. And if I find it is not right for you to be with that woman, even if you think it is important, I have a right to question you. Because now you belong to me. And the same thing to me, to her. And that, that is the same relationship we have with our God. There are things that you do today, and Jesus has got every right to question you. Because Jesus is our master. Jesus is molding us. Jesus is shaping us. And Jesus is taking us a place. There is a vision that Jesus has for our relationship with him. And there are things that you cannot have when you have got a relationship with Jesus because they will hinder the direction and the place where Jesus is taking you. There are things that you cannot do when you have got a relationship with Jesus because they will hinder the purpose and the vision of our Lord. Went down to the potter's house. He saw, the, he saw three things. He saw three things.
And these are the three things that I want to talk about this morning. He saw, number one, he saw the porter. He saw who? The porter. And who was the porter? This was a very intelligent, capable, skilled artisan, a workman who knows exactly what he's doing. The porter knew exactly what he was doing. Number two, he saw a wheel that the porter was spinning. He saw a wheel that the porter was spinning. And as the porter was spinning the wheel, as the wheel was running over the clay, and the wheel was turning loud and loud and loud, the porter's heart was shaping the clay. The wheel is running, the porter is shaping. I wish I had that little, little Sharhani machine, Shinka machine, you know? You are, you are turning the wheel, and the heart is shaping what you want this pot to become, or what you want this pot to become. Number three, I say he saw the porter. Number two, he saw the wheel. Number three, he saw the clay. The clay is sad, is soil, it is valueless. The clay on the ground is valueless. The clay on the ground has no value. If I carry some soil with you, with me, and I tell you I want to sell you the soil, you tell me, Pastor, I can't buy it from you. It is valueless. I can also pick mine and carry it with me. But the clay becomes valuable when it is put in the herd of a potter. The clay becomes valuable when it is in the herd of the potter. Because the potter will be able to mold a pottery that can be even priceless. So expensive that you cannot put money on it. Because it is hard tailored or hard made by the potter. And in this case, the clay is you and I. The clay is you and I. We are of no use in the kingdom of God. Before we are put in the herd of the potter who is our God. We are of no value, of, 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 of no importance to the kingdom of God until we are picked by the potter who is our God and we are put in the hands of God. Any one of us before we came to Christ, we were wretched by life. Any one of us before we knew Christ, we were living our own ways. Any one of us before we came to Christ, we were living lives of defeat. We were of no use to the kingdom of God. We were of no value or we were not adding any value in the kingdom of God. Until the day the master potter who is our God reached out to you and he picked you. And when he picked you, he started putting you on his wheel. What is the wheel? The wheel is the circumstances and the situations and the motions that we go through as people of God. Hallelujah. The times that we go through. Because he uses the wheel to mold us and to shape us and to make us what he wants us to be. I am here to tell you. When you are going through and whenever this wheel is moving. Sometimes it moves in circles and circles and circles and circles. Until sometimes you are confused. You wonder what, is about, what about my life? What will I ever become? What will I ever end up being? Because I'm like I'm moving in circles and circles. But I'm here to declare it to you. As long as you are in the hands of the porter. Even if you are feeling like you are moving in motion. Circles and circles and circles. Situation after situation. Issue after issue, problem after problem, but you're in the hands of the porter. You finally become something. Oh, come on, somebody, put those hands together for Jesus. I say, as long as you are in the hands of the porter, and as long as the wheel is being turned by the porter, there is something the heart of the porter is doing, and he is shaping you. He is shaping your destiny. He is shaping your life. You might not like it. It might not like look like so. But I am telling you, as long as you are in the hands of the Savior, as long as you are in the God's heart, there is something. There is something. Whether you can see it, whether you can understand it, whether you don't understand it, He is still doing something with your life as long as you are in his hands 
Sometimes the onlookers, if you go to a potter's house and you see that wheel turn and you are looking, you might never understand what the potter is doing. But remember, he's a master artisan. Remember, he's a skilled worker. Remember, he have got, um, uh, he have got a vision of what he's doing with your life. I don't know whose life. They are feeling like it is spinning and spinning until people are asking you, what will you end up being? What is happening in your life? I am here to declare it to you. As long as you are in the hands of the Savior, as long as you are following Jesus, as long as you are obeying the Lord, as long as you have come to him, as long as you are studying the scripture, as long as you are praying, and even if nothing is happening, because many a times we have got this thing in us, that Lord, if this healing does not come to me, then the Lord, you are not with me. That's not true. The Lord sometimes can let you even die. Because even dying is going to be with him. Hello? He doesn't have to do it your way. Sometimes he will let you go through issues, not because you are, you are not praying, not because you are not tithing, not because you are not giving, not because you are not good. Because he is shaping you. Sometimes he will let you, by the way, for any portrait to come out good, it will have to be put through fire. Oh yes, no pottery that will be of any worth or any use without going through finance fire or refinance fire. These, these things that we wear, one time, they were hidden, there were metals that were hidden in the soil. The watches that we wear, amen, the wraps, they were sometimes hidden in the soil. A lot of work has been done for us to have the finished material that greets us and that shines and that whenever we wear it, it looks now like bring, bring. But for it to be where it is, a lot of work was turn so my friend whenever you find like life it's just it's just going in circles round and loud and loud and even other people are asking you are, are you sure that the lord is with you who told you if god is with you you are not going to suffer yes you will suffer even when the lord is with you you will go through fire even when the lord is near you the only thing that happens when the Lord is with you and you're in, in that pain is that you have joy in the storm. To have God, it doesn't mean uh, uh, the absence of storm. No. Because we have taught the word of God sometimes or we have learned the word of God the long way. That sometimes when I go through storm, I feel like God has forsaken me. Being in storm does not mean God has forsaken you. Even the boat where Jesus was riding, one time it was locked with a lot of storm. And it was moving right to the left. And even the waters were entering in. But there was peace in the boat because Jesus was in the boat. As long as Jesus is in your boat, issues will come, things will happen. But as long as Jesus is in the boat, let me tell you, even in the storm, you still see him as God. Praise the name of the Lord. Because a lot of us, we get discouraged when you see things are not going your way. And in every one of us, in every one of us, we have to be shaped by this wheel and the wheel will have to spin on us. And when the wheel is spinning, sometimes it's not good. When the wheel is spinning, this body does not like it. When the wheel is spinning, sometimes there are issues. And the, when the fire is burning, you feel the heat of the fire. But the Lord is molding you. The Lord is shaping you. The Lord is making you a better person. The Lord is shaping your character. The Lord is building you. The Lord is teaching you on how to trust on him. You are the clay. And clay is valueless until it is put in the heart of the potter. Tell your neighbor you are the clay. And thank God you are in the heart of the potter. Oh, come on, tell them, thank God you're in the hands of the potter. The potter is a master artisan. 
You might not know what is in his mind. Sometimes you look at the brother you wonder now where is his life going? But as long as this brother is walking in the Lord, as long as this brother is in prayer, as long as this brother is obeying the word of God, as long as this brother is walking in the Lord and living in God and serving God and is in the hands of God, leave the brother alone. Leave the sister alone. God is still working on them and they are still heading to greatness. You might never see it. You might not know notice it but as long as they are in the hands of God as long as they are serving God leave them alone the potter knows the master potter knows what he is doing with them oh yes the master potter know what he's doing with your son the master potter know what he's doing with your daughter the master potter know what he's doing with your life the master potter know what he's doing with your situation as long as you are in his hand the greatest thing is to come and avail yourself in Master Potter's heart. The disciples availed themselves when they were called. When John and James and Peter and the rest were called. And they availed themselves in the house of God. The Master Potter started using them. Not every day life was good for them. There were times they were asking Jesus questions. There were times they would get very anxious. There were times they would wonder, where are we going? But that did not mean Jesus did not have a plan for them. I remember one time Peter looked at Jesus right on his eyes. And he asked him, Jesus, because if Peter had come for the three C's, you know the three C's? A car? Good cash and good cell phone back in the day. If you'd ask a girl, she would ask you, Do you have the three C's? I said, A girl for a heart of marriage. Do you have a car? What do you drive? Uh, how is your bank account like? And uh, when you pull out your phone, they will look what kind. <laughs> but let me tell you even without the three C's the Lord as long as in his heart he'll still work on you and he'll make you what he desires you to be sometimes you look at a person you wonder where they are, are they going and sometimes you look at them and you wonder is the Lord still with them as long as they have come and they are following the Lord will still work out things on the, your life. It's only that sometimes they are on the spin. And the good thing with about the spin and the heat of the spinning, it is shaping you. It is making you a better person. It is building your character. Sometimes the Lord will say, away with the cash for a certain period of time. I want my, this, this man, I want this woman to survive without cash. Because it is not cash that makes them live. It is me, Jesus, who makes them live. And I want them to trust on me. Not to trust on their money. Not to trust on what they have in the bank. And now then, he will make your bank lead negative. How many times have I gone to that ATM? I put those numbers and I see my account is reading negative, And the bills are from there to there. I go home, I look at my wife, I tell her even money to pay the mortgage, there is nothing. My wife looks at me, you spend it all? <laughs> you have brought it? And the Lord is teaching us to live by faith and to trust him even for the payment of? I tell my wife, honey, what we are going to do, we will go to church and we will kneel down and we will tell the Lord, these are all our bills. How many times have I come with bills here at night alone? And I tell the Lord, look at these bills. If Lord, they are not paid, it is not me who is going to be ashamed. It is your name that will be ashamed. When those people will come and start telling me, lighting those, th that billboard in my house, that the house is on sale because I couldn't pay the, the mortgage, Lord, it will be about you. And guess what? Down the line, God will work out a plan and then he will provide. But he, he is happy that I trusted in him for the provision. And as I am trusting on him for the provision, he works on my character. He works on me. 
There are things that he's putting on me. The thing was not about money. Money was just a thing he touched so that I may pay more attention to him. Money was just something he touched so that I may feel the heat and tell the Lord, the heat is too much, Lord, on this seat. Uh, come, come for me. And I'm, as I'm telling him to come for me, there are other things in my heart he's working on. It is the wheel that is spinning on me. It is the wheel that is turning on me. Let me tell you when wheel is turning on you, it can turn on your marriage, it can turn on your finances, it can turn on your health, it can turn from any direction. But as long as you are in the master's heart, it is well, it is well, it is well, it is well with you. As long as you are in his hands. Look at his hands. Whenever that thing is spinning, the hands is shaping what this person I want them to become. What this man I want him to become. What this woman I want him to become. All the portrait things don't look alike. Oh yes, we have got jazz, we have got pot, we have got different things, and they are all portly. But they are, they are, they are shaped and molded by a master artist. Look at the one that Brother Stephen is showing us. I like Brother Stephen because he's always in the spirit. Let us appreciate that, brother. Look at the hands of the potter. Those hearts know what they are doing. Anybody who would come when that thing was a cray, you would wonder, now this cray, what will it become? Whenever people look at you, they look at you and they wonder, now this guy, what is he going to become? He has said he has come to the Lord. Now this girl, what will she become? We know her very well. Because when you are clay, that was not in the hands of the master, they knew you. They knew you. And sometimes they'll look at you and they will judge you. And they will tell you you'll never amount to anything. Tell them they are liars. As long as I am in the hands of the master, I will end up becoming something. I will end up becoming like him. I will become more like Jesus. And the things that Jesus used to do, I will do them because I am like him. It's the name of the Lord. He called us to shape us. He called us to, uh, to, to mold us. He called us to make us. Look at that, 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 that pot that is being made there. The master, the, 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 the artisan knows what he's doing. The, the, it, it's spinning, it is rolling, but he's making beautiful rise on it. But when that clay is being snatched from it, there is some pain. If it were you, there will be pain that it will be feeling. There are issues that will be going on that won't be very comfortable. Sometimes we are exposed to uncomfortable things as the Lord is working on us. And as long as we are in the hands of the porter, things will work out. He told Jeremiah to go down because the Israelites were complaining. Judah was complaining about how God was treating them and they were the children of God. And the Lord told Judah, the house of Judah, as the porter have got right to make whatever pot he want to make. Don't I have a right as your God to shape you and mold you and make you what I want you to be? Easter is about potter. Master potter our Lord, picking us on the floor. Uh, clay that is useless. Clay that cannot make anything. Clay that used very, look valueless. Clay that cannot be used by anybody. He put us in his hand and he mold us. By the way, did you know, you know this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is very powerful. It's very organized. You know, when Judas saw Jesus at the cross, betrayed Jesus, and he was given 30 silver of coin. And when he held the money, he didn't like it because he knew and he had walked with Jesus. So he decided to throw back the money to the temple. And when he threw back the money to the temple, Bible says clearly that money, they said we cannot put it in the treasury because now this is blood money. It has sold, this was money that, uh, that has bought or that, uh, that, uh, that Jesus was sold and it is full of the blood of Jesus. And somebody suggested something very powerful. He said, let us go and buy a potter's field. What is potter's field? Potter's field is the field where all the broken pots are thrown. It is the, uh, the field when a potter's 
what broke beyond repair it is thrown in that field that money of the blood of Jesus was uh, bought a field where every broken pot is thrown and when the broken pots are thrown in the field of Jesus bought by the money of the blood oh I thank God for the field I thank God for that field because when I am thrown in that uh, field when I am worthless when I am shapeless when I am beyond repair the master will pick me from his own his own field because it was bought by his own money the field was bought by the money of the blood of Jesus he will pick me from there a lot of us we are broken we were thrown there because we are beyond repair our lives were beyond repair. We were thrown on the potter's field. Our lives were thrown there. We are living lives that were beyond repair. But I thank God because the field belongs to our God. Because it was bought by his, the money of his blood. And